welcome to Beachpreneurs to our virtual table topics. You're here with Kelly. And Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> the pause is always where I'm supposed to say it myself. <laughs> so, and our guest, our BT guest today is Candace Davis. Hi, Candace. Hi. <laughs> I keep muting and unmuting myself inappropriately. <laughs> Just Hello. stay unmuted. We want to hear all your good stuff. <laughs> Hello. So Candace is going to be uh, taking the reins and teaching us for a little while this morning. Um, I'm going to mute everyone except us for right now. And then later when we have questions, uh, you're welcome to unmute and shout out. But uh, Hey, welcome. Before we get going with Candace, uh, I do, Nicole and I wanted to share a little bit. You guys know we have events at the beach, a variety of events for women only, for awesome entrepreneurial women only. <laughs> We're, we, we only accept the very best. It just so happens that everyone we know is the best. We but, know awesome people. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to share a little bit about um, Beach Condo because we've got uh, we've got a growing list of awesome women who are joining us at the condo. So Nicole, you want to describe condo? Yes. Yeah, so okay. Well, we have three events. We have Beach Camp, which is the hotel event in Daytona Beach. And then we have the Beach House, which is the mastermind retreat which is, I think, full, or we have one spot left there. Maybe. One, maybe one spot left for March. And then there's the beach condo, which is brand new and super exciting. So, um, and I know some of you have been to beach camp, and Candace has been to beach house too, which yep. is how we bubble up. Once we get to know you and love you, then you bubble up through our, our stuff, and we just want to show everybody how awesome you are. So, and uh, Karen has been to beach camp. Hey, Karen. <laughs> um, the beach condo came about this last February because Kelly lives in Michigan and I live here on the Gulf of Mexico in Pensacola, Florida. So we just weren't spending enough time together and Kelly kind of doesn't love the cold so much up in Michigan in February. So we said, she said she wanted to snowbird. Well, she's wanted to snowbird for a few years and then grandbabies happened. So that got stalled a little bit. But this year she said, I want to snowbird in February. And so we started to look at condos and we found this great big condo. Um, right on the Gulf is beautiful. Four bedrooms, way too big for just the two of us. And so she came down for four weeks and uh, we spent the four weeks together. We had some friends coming and going a little bit and uh, she loved it. I loved it. And then we went straight into the beach house. But what we decided is that we wanted more people because Kelly's all about the more people. <laughs> and I'm the big introvert. So I'm like, well, I would love more people too for part of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so what we agreed upon is that we um, have rented four condos, each four bedrooms, in the same complex. They're not right next door to each other, but they're in the same parking lot complex. They're all in the Gulf of Mexico. And for one or two weeks, we're inviting awesome female entrepreneurs to come and experience the beach condo with us. It will be um, camp style, which I was a camp counselor, so everything is camp style to me. So every day, kind of like when you go on a cruise, you get a piece of paper and it says, here's your itinerary. So it'll be like, hey, at 10 o'clock, you can do yoga with Nicole at the sloth condo, or you can do, um, well, Cal, what's something you would do? <laughs> Hey, look at my sales page. <laughs> Talk. Look at my sales page in the Lemur condo with Kelly in the blue room. So always be something going on. Always have meal options together. Always have the opportunity <laughs> to be together or to have alone time and to walk the beach by yourself, to decompress. Each condo will have its own camp counselor. We'll just kind of be keeping an eye and making sure, you know, that you are good. Everything's fine. Of course, we're available too. And uh, so there'll be lots of fun stuff. We'll probably go see the slots again, maybe hold a baby kangaroo if we can find one. 
and uh, lots of businessy stuff too. We're doing hot seats if we have time, I think, or possible hot seats. Definitely looking at sales pages and talking about topics, like we do the topic tables at the at each camp. And so that's it. That's it. That's it. So this is. I want you guys to think about this as like I, I can take a vacation, and it's a business write-off. Mm -hmm. because it is a business experience it's just not the same kind of intense masterminding that we do at the house you got a little more autonomy and freedom of how you you know, just design your own adventure but the really exciting news is that well candace is coming candace is all signed well, up I'm, I'm well. to the flop condo <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, just got confirmation yesterday, Marusha Murphy is coming, Elaine Yay. Allen is coming, and Kimberly Wright is coming. Stop it. Stop so, it. This is going to be awesome. It, this is super exciting. So if you want to talk to me about the condo, send me a message, shoot me a note. I'd be happy to get on the phone with you and answer questions. The cost for the for one week is two thousand. The second week is fifteen hundred. If you want to get signed up for Beach Condo, you have time to do an eight pay plan, which if you start that right now, that's two seventy five a month for eight months. So you can budget it right out. All you right. will have your own bedroom, but not all of the units have their own bathrooms. But you will have your own bedroom, and. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, you can do as much businessy stuff with each other or with us, you know, during our scheduled times. Um, or, you know, when I went with Kelly, I just, my goal was just to get bored because it had been so long since I'd actually been bored. You guys are laughing. You get me, right? <laughs> and it actually, it took a while because I'm like, you know, I'm doing my meditations upstairs. You know, the open the beach chair and I'm doing yoga on the deck and I'm like okay come on I've got my stack of books this high I'm like okay we can do this come on brain this is your chance for us it took a couple weeks but finally I'm like okay I got this this is me again instead of me <laughs> um, <laughs> you're like I don't know if I can spend a week with her <laughs> so yeah come get bored with us yes come yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is like Nicole <laughs> you make me crazy woman, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Candace Davis. Woo! Yes, ma'am. Oh, we were so happy to have you speak at Beach Camp. You have been inspiring people to realize, to accept and celebrate that they've got a book in them and that there's more than one way to tackle it. So now we just want to turn the reins over to you and let us learn Fast. from you. Okay. <laughs> well, I have slides. May I have sharing permission, Kelly? Oh, yeah. Slides. Oh, you're fancy. They're not many. They're not many. It's just so you don't have to sit here and just stare at my face the entire time. I love time. staring at your beautiful face. Well, first, tell us a little of your background. Is that slide one? It's, it's, it's like slide three. Okay. It, it'll come in there. there. It'll come in there. I'm not so good at the patient <laughs> So do you see sharing functions now? I do. Of? Thank you very much. Awesome. And Kelly and Nicole, like, please interrupt with your comments and your thoughts and stuff along the way so I'm not feeling like I'm giving a lecture. That would be great. So I want to talk about how you can create impact and income with your best-selling book. And I use the term best-selling very, very intentionally. So you'll see why in just a minute. And what we're going to cover is we're going to cover the myths and confusion surrounding what a best-selling book actually is. And then we're going to talk about some ways you can use a book to create more income and to share your message and your story and to influence and positively impact more people. So who am I? Um, to date, I've written, I think, 17 books. I've been a ghostwriter for about 15 years. I've been a book editor for that entire time. I've been an author coach for about eight years, and I currently still do all of those things and have a great time doing them. I mostly work with coaches, speakers, business owners who want to create ability for themselves in their business, who want to um, get more exposure for their brands, and they've figured out what I've always known, 
there's no better way than writing a book to do that. I know I'm very, very biased, but that's okay. So bestseller versus bestselling. This has driven me a little bit crazy over recent years because every program now wants to teach you how you can have an Amazon bestseller, right? Because you want to be able to say, oh, I had an Amazon bestseller book. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. That can have some benefits um, for you. But a lot of times what they're selling you isn't really a bestseller technically. Because even though you get a uh, little notification that says you were a bestseller for a minute on Amazon in some niche, that doesn't mean that Amazon recognizes you as a bestseller. This is an Amazon bestseller. And how do you know? Well, you know because it's got that little orange sticker at the top, that little orange logo that says bestseller. Well, Michelle Obama was number one for like more than a year out of all the books selling on all of Amazon in every single category. And most of us are never going to do that. And that's okay. We don't have to. But that's what a bestseller is by Amazon's definition. You have to, you have to actually rank in their in their uh, top categories. You can't just rank in a sub niche and say that you're an Amazon bestseller. And so while you can go out and say it to the world if you want to, like you could niche down each of these niches. Let's say you had a book on business and money and you went into a subtopic and another subtopic and you hit number one. That's great. You should celebrate it. But number one, it doesn't mean that you sold many books because you could do that with five books, depending on who else is competing with you in that category on that day and time. So it's something to celebrate, yes, but it doesn't mean that you've made any money. <laughs> and it doesn't mean you've made any money. You may not have sold. And Amazon has rules, you guys. They have a lot, a lot of rules, and they will snatch you up. So if you decide you want to slap a label on your book that says, I was an Amazon bestseller because you made, uh, you know, rank number three in your niche, they can take you down. They can take your whole book down and prevent you from selling it on Amazon. You're just not allowed to do it unless they have named you an Amazon bestseller. So is it a good goal? Maybe, but is it a necessary goal? Absolutely not. So I like to tell my clients to shoot for best selling. Best selling means you sell lots of books. So back before, <laughs> in the good old days, before Amazon was the behemoth that it is, the whole goal for authors was to be a New York Times bestseller, right? And that's still a great thing, but most people aren't really reaching for that anymore. They're reaching for Amazon. Well, that system was totally gameable. And I know because I gamed it. Um, if you knew which stores reported to the New York Times bestseller list, you could buy books in those stores and help that author to climb the list, right? Because not every store reported. So it was no different than kind of playing the niches with Amazon. Didn't mean you sold a lot of books. You just happened to sell a lot of books in the stores that reported. So bestseller is this sort of nebulous thing that may or may not have value, not just on Amazon, but on any of the list. Best selling means that you're selling lots of books and that can take place over a really long time. So I have clients that wrote their books six, seven years ago that are still selling 20, 30, 100 books a month. They're very happy with the money that they're bringing home from a book that they wrote ages ago, ages and ages and ages ago. So I really like to tell people focus on best selling where you're actually making money as opposed to bestseller, where you kind of get a little bit of bragging rights, but for anyone who really knows how the system works, it's not really any bragging rights and it doesn't do a lot for you. Using the term incorrectly could get you in trouble with some of the, bu with some of the booksellers, particularly the only bookseller anyone really thinks about anymore, Amazon. It's interesting. Because I'm, I'm very much into the indie bookstores, but there's probably an Amazon package on my front door almost every day. So, you know, convenience pretty much trumps all. So if you're going to focus on best selling, that means you want to sell a lot of books. And that's the first way that you can create impact and income with your book is by selling your books. So it's great to write a book, right? But I see a lot of authors who write a book. It can even be a great book, but they don't get out there and sell it. This is my beautiful client. This is Dolly Carlson and her husband, Tom Carlson, at a recent book signing that she did at a bookstore. And she's really good. She did self-publish her book. But she was selling it so well as a self-published author, and she was selling in bookstores that a publisher came and offered her a deal. So the copy you see there is a, a, a traditional publishing book. But Dolly hustles and sells her book. She's retired. Her husband's retired. They're in their early 70s. 
she gets out there and sells her book and she makes a good amount of income from book sales. So a lot of times I hear experts tell people, well, don't worry about book sales. Most people aren't going to sell very many books. They quote the statistics that most, most authors, this is sad, you guys, never sell more than a hundred copies of their book. And it's sadly true because they don't promote it and they don't market it. So how do you think anybody's going to find it? There are a bazillion books on Amazon now, but you can make a real significant income from book sales. And Dolly has figured out even before she got her traditional publishing deal. In fact, she wouldn't have gotten the deal without the sales. She's figured out how to do that. Well, she's beautiful. So she puts her beautiful self out there and she markets her book. So she's also impacting a lot of people because hers is a historical fiction book, but it's based on her family's immigration from Ireland and the way that impacted the following generations and gotten such a wonderful response from people who like the way that she portrays, I'm going to say it wrong, South Boston, Southie, culture in a positive light because in the movies and on television it's often portrayed as criminal and mob and mafia and things like that and she shows a whole different side to the beautiful culture that she grew up in in south boston for her own childhood so you really can have an impact you really can make money through book sales don't let anybody tell you that you can't so you guys every time i do a presentation i put this client in there you're gonna get sick of seeing her but i love her so you can make a lot, you can make a big impact and you can make a lot of money by becoming the media's go-to expert on your subject matter with your book. So this is my client, Patrice. She wrote a book about money. She wrote three books about money. The first one didn't do all that great because it was aimed at college students who mostly don't care about money because they're spending their parents' money. Um, but the second one did fantastic. She had a great marketing strategy in place and slowly over months, and then years, she began to position herself as an expert on personal finance. She had a slightly different twist than the other experts. She wasn't saying, she was saying, buy your latte, enjoy your latte, but make more money so you can pay for your latte. That was more of her twist as opposed to the deprivation twist that was really popular from, I don't know, Susie Orman in that sort of school of thought. So you can really use your book to position you as a media expert because it gives producers something to hold in their hand, something to talk about. They're not gonna invite you on the show just to talk about money unless they can demonstrate to the audience that you're the expert. Your book demonstrates that you're the expert. So Patrice has used her book, it's called um, Real Money Answers for Every Woman. She used the book to appear on lots of local radio shows, um, TV shows, podcasts. She's also been on Steve Harvey, daytime talk show, uh, syndicated radio shows, Dr. Oz. Why she was on Dr. Oz, I have no idea. Her book is about money, but Hey, he called, she answered, it all worked out. So you can, it's also created for her a huge platform because for her, wealth is more about wholeness, not just about money. And it's, it's allowed her to reach more people to share her message that, you know, money is great and you need it and it help, allows you to do great things. But if it's all you have, then you're really still poor. And she's spreading a message about, called Redefining Wealth is kind of her new, her new philosophy. But without her book, she wouldn't have been able to position her. Well, she might have been able to, but it would have been much more difficult for her to position herself um, as the expert. And she's sort of a media go-to at this point. The downside with that, she says, is that she can never just kind of let go and get out of shape because if anyone calls, she wants to be ready to go on TV. So she has to have clothes in the closet and that type of stuff and be ready to go. Not going to work for everybody. Not everybody wants to do that, but it works well for her. Um, see, lead and sell. So a lot of people don't really want a public image. So they want to write a book, but they don't necessarily want to appear on radio and TV and that type of thing. Those of us who are more introverted, it's not necessarily our thing. But you can use your book to grow your email list, to lead people to your products, and to sell them your products and services. I have so many clients who've done this very, very successfully, but Worse, I, well, on the downside, I see so many books where authors miss this opportunity. Yeah, I'll be turning through the book page after page, and these are self-published books. A lot of times, traditional publishers won't allow you to have those kinds of links in their book. They just, they may allow you one link in your bio, and they won't allow you to put links where they actually make sense in your book. I see so many authors who miss the opportunity to bring readers who like what you have to say and want more from you back to their website where they can capture them on their email list and sell them things. 
So I talk to authors about how they can seed their book with relevant opt-in opportunities, not anything obnoxious, you guys. It's not going to be on every page. It's not going to be overwhelming. And certainly not going to be a case where in order to get the full value of the book, you have to opt in. I have bought a book like that, and I was so irritated, I can't even begin to tell you. I would never buy anything from that person again. I think she's a perfectly nice person. She probably just didn't know, made a mistake, or was misdirected, but it was a total turnoff for me to, for me to be reading the book, and in order to get the full value of the book, what was promised in the book, I had to go to her website and opt in. I paid for the book. Give me the information. So if you give great content, I'm just saying, Nicole, stop laughing. So if you give great content in your book, give great value, but then give extra value, some kind of bonus that they can come to your website and get. Um, if you guys know Natalie Collins, she does this really well with her uh, book she puts out every year. It's the Biz Planning book or the Biz Planner book. But each year when you buy it, she has a bonus course where she walks you through, it's a video course where she walks you through page by page how to implement the book and how to make it best work for you. So people buy her book. She has seeded the book with opportunities to opt in and get that bonus. She leads them with that seed right back to her website where they opt in. Now they're on, the, on her list. So she can sell them whatever relevant products and services she wants to sell them at that point. It's a really simple strategy. The whole key though is to write a great book where they fall in love with you and fall in love with what you have to offer and to then give them something that adds value to it. You know, just don't fall into that trap of bait and switch where they think they're gonna get something great and they get 80% of it and have to go to your, your um, website to get the rest. That's not really gonna win you friends or positively influence people. I'm rereading that book right now. But uh, you, can, you can seed your book with opportunities for people to get more and lead them back where you can give them more and also sell them your products and services. So I wish I had a better picture. This wasn't super clear, but you can land better speaking engagements with your um, book. This is my wonderful client, Suzanne. Suzanne is a crisis consultant crisis management consultant. I don't know why I can never get that right. It's not a tongue twister. She's a crisis management consultant. And she lives in Canada, but she does a lot of speaking down here in the U.S. of A. She does a lot of consulting down here in the U.S. of A. But she was not getting paid very well for speaking engagements. In fact, she wasn't getting paid at all. She was often having to foot the bill of flying from Canada to these locations to show up and speak. She'd get a lovely, you know, something for her resume. But it was coming out of her pocket. It was costing her money. So Suzanne wrote a book called Disaster Heroes, which I love this book because it's not about her. It's so cool. She highlights civilians in like 10 different cities around the world who stepped up in times of serious man-made or natural disaster to pitch in and make sure things were better, to help with the recovery, to help with rescue efforts and things of that nature. And she profiles these people in a way that just makes you fall in love with every single one of them, really recognize that any one of us could be a hero at any time if called upon and in the right situation. So Suzanne wrote that book and she was so smart, you guys. She hired two interns, unpaid interns who got college credit from her alma mater to do a social media campaign for her. Social media really wasn't her big thing at that time. So she put those lovely young people who do that all day to use doing that for her. And in 2016, her book got out there in a really big way through the social media campaign. And in 2016, she was invited to speak at the White House. So this is a picture she took after she had spoken at a FEMA award at the White House. But she got to see the Obama White House, man. I would have loved that. But I mean, that would have been awesome. But she has since used that. Of course, that was, I don't think she got paid to speak at that event. But having spoke at the White House, she now has been able to encourage uh, event planners to pay her when she comes to speak. That still allows her to speak at the nonprofits where she was speaking before. And really, she has a heart for those organizations. And she doesn't want to charge them, but she's able to charge other people more now, which allows her to pick and choose where she wants to speak for free, not feel the pressure of, oh, I have to add it to my resume. She's got the White House on her resume. She's going to be perfectly fine. But without that book, Disaster Heroes, it's highly unlikely 
that the uh, leaders of the organization would have discovered her, that FEMA would have chosen her as the person to write, to uh, speak at this event. And it's really interesting. Suzanne is very, she's got a lot of chutzpah. She asked the, um, golly day, he was the first Secretary of Homeland Security to write the foreword for her book. They didn't know each other, but she wrote and asked him, and she wrote such a great um uh, pitch letter telling him about the fact that she was highlighting these citizens who had done these things that he couldn't say no. He said yes, and he wrote the foreword for her book. And that certainly did not hurt things when she was um, seeking these consulting jobs and speaking engagements, particularly with the federal government. So writing your book can really help you to land better speaking engagements, can help you get paid for speaking engagements. Some of my clients, though, they don't get paid for speaking engagements. What they do is they negotiate for the event planners to buy copies of their book for everyone who's going to be in attendance. And so for them, it doesn't really matter to them. They get the money one way or the other. Or of course they can sell their book um, at the speaking engagement. So either way, whether you get paid for the engagement or not, it's a way to be able to monetize the speaking engagement that might not have been mo as monetizable before. And it's a low end product. So instead of just having a $2,000 service to sell, you have something that people who may not no, like can trust you quite enough to give you two thousand dollars yet or may not have the budget for it or just may not be interested in that product a book gives you something that they can leave with for probably 20 bucks take home and remember you and your message and then when you come when that service that you offer comes up in their lives again they're much more likely to remember you if they took home a book than if they just heard you speak took a few notes and never saw those notes again so it can really help those of you who want to have a speaking career writing a book can really uh, help you launch that platform to the next level. And the last way I wanted to share, hmm, this slide is not good because everything's covered up with the video, <laughs> but the last way I wanted to share that writing a book can help you increase your impact and your income is to launch a new line of business. This is my client Yvette. Yvette Gavin um, is one of the smartest people I've met and she manages corporate America like very few people. She's learned how to navigate those halls like very few people uh, ever do. And I used to work in corporate. She's, she's a, a beast in corporate America. She managed to work her way up to the executive level without a college degree um, into a six-figure salary, working for some major corporations like Delta Airlines and Cox Communications, big corporations. And it wasn't just that Nicole, that Yvette was great at um, landing the job. She was great at keeping the job. She was great at negotiating her salary and benefits. She was great at getting to the next level through promotion. And some of her coworkers kind of saw what she was doing and were like, well, can you help us? Like, we want some of what you have too. So she began sort of casually coaching people to get to the next level in their business and realized that she really had a talent for it. And she decided to launch a, a coaching and consulting firm. So she does more than just help people with their careers. But that's one of the primary things that she does. She does it so well, you guys. If I were looking for a job, I would definitely, I would hire, I would hire Yvette. I would work with, work with her to help me get a job in corporate America and help me negotiate uh, those benefits. So she wrote a book called Recalibrate. And it's navigating the job market with confidence because it's what she knows incredibly well. Now, I would not have ever thought about I wouldn't even have thought about her writing a book on that particular topic because it seems like, oh, well, maybe those are things that people can look up. But if you think about actually having a system that takes you from everything from the job search process all the way through negotiating your salary and benefits, it's a whole lot of Googling and, and websites that you're going to have to go to to be able to pull all it together. And Yvette has pulled it together in a system and she launched her business and her book at about the same time. And the reason it was important for her to have the book was because she was already pretty well known in her community as a successful uh, corporate executive. And she wanted to be known now as a business owner and expert. And her book has helped her do that. She's launched the business quite successfully and she's giving trainings and doing a lot of speaking all around the country. So that's if you're thinking about pivoting to a new line of business or a totally new business altogether, writing a book can really help you get the visibility and repositioning that you want to have. So that's the fifth way that writing a book can help you grow your business and impact people. And the last way was one that I was in total denial about, you guys, which is it can help you sell physical products. I could not figure out, like, how could a book help you sell physical products other than your physical book? It just didn't make sense to me. But I had one client who wrote 
a somewhat controversial parenting book. She has extreme philosophies and people loved it. Um, her target audience was really excited about the book. And then she just simply started making t-shirts. She started making t-shirts that had quotes from the book and, and people wanted them. They started, she started selling them through Facebook Messenger. She just said, message me if you want a book. And now she sells them, if you want a t-shirt, now she sells them from her website. So she started with the book and moved into physical products. On the other hand, I have a client who owns an online boutique. It's a seven-figure business. It's doing very well, for having only been in business for three years. She has a storefront in Virginia where you can go in as well, but she always says that's kind of her... Um, it's kind of a prop for her because she really does all of her business online. People, even local people buy stuff online. Very few people come into the shop, but she's writing her book right now because she looked at um, a couple of other business owners who would use their book to get exposure for their business. Oh, golly day. I can't think of the woman's name. She wrote a book called The Girl Boss that Netflix has now made into a show, but she had a fashion um, a fashion website. And so my client was inspired by that and thought, well, I can use my book to get more exposure for my business as well. She hasn't even written the book yet. She just has um, coming in fall of, uh, well, she's almost done writing it, but coming in fall of 2019. And she's got it on her bio and she's using it to get more exposure for her business right now. I have no doubt that it's going to help her sell more physical products because the more people know about her, the more they can, they will get to know, like, and trust her and understand what her business is and why it's different from every other online boutique. So yeah, believe it or not, writing a book can help you sell physical products. I wasn't 100% sold on it, but I'm, I'm sold on it now because I see people doing it. So that's what I have for you guys. I'm all ready for questions if you have some Kelly and Nicole. Y'all didn't jump in. <laughs> you were just on a roll. I, don't know you. I think Karen said that that was Sophie Amorosa. Is that right? That is. She's right. Uh, she's 100% correct. Yes, Karen. <laughs> of course she is. Yes, my friend. Mm. Well, you're so well prepared, Candace. <laughs> the, and you have such great use of PowerPoint. I'm never good at PowerPoint. <laughs> what? I'm I I will never use PowerPoint unless I have to. Oh. And mostly because I don't like PowerPoints. But your PowerPoint was beautiful. <laughs> it's it's hard to put up with. <laughs> I'm sorry, Nicole. Nicole, it took me a really long time because I used to try to put everything on the PowerPoint. So yes. that's a long way. <laughs> that's my pet peeve is that most, and this, and it's changed. People are really starting to see, you know, the value of less is more. But For sure. For sure. <sighs> I, yeah, I've come a long way, believe me. <laughs> So, everyone needs a book? <laughs> so, I don't think everyone needs a book, but I think everyone who's in business for themselves or even freelancing could benefit from writing mm -hmm. a book. If, like someone who just has no interest and is just blah, doesn't even read, okay, don't write a book. You don't have to. You can find other ways to do it. But I think anyone who takes the time to write a good book, first of all, listen, you've got either a story or knowledge or both that somebody else wants and needs. I know that you do. I've never met a person over the age of maybe, okay, I'm gonna be real generous and say eight, and it might be six, who didn't have enough of a story or knowledge that they could share with somebody. I mean, I literally asked my niece when she was like 11, I said, Ava, so what would you write a book about if you look? And she, her answer was immediate. Like you guys, she didn't go, oh, well, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't lived long enough. No, she said, oh, I would write a book to teach people how to make friends. I'm great at that. Oh, get it, Ava. I mean, the reality is, though, you have something, whether it's your story or your knowledge, that can really benefit someone else and benefiting someone else could serve your business as well. If you hate books, you just broke my heart. Don't write one. <laughs> or hire <laughs> you to write one. <laughs> no, if you hate books, you don't want one at all. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think everyone in business could really benefit. I've, I've not seen anyone who can't benefit from it. 
Mm -hmm. And one of your interesting angles is that you talk a lot about short books. Yeah. Talk, talk about that a little bit, about the length of the book and your goals for the book and why you like short books. So I love short books because readers love short books. And I believe in giving readers some of what they want. So, you know, a lot of people get overwhelmed by the idea that they have to write two or 300 pages because that's a lot of what we see in the bookstore, although be careful because a lot of that can be white space, but, mm -hmm. you know, it, or fluff, a lot of fluff, but it doesn't need to be that. So what I've discovered is that 30,000 words is kind of a sweet spot, and that's about 100 type pages, depending on how you're fiddling with font and margins and stuff, mm -hmm. but 30,000 words is what readers are responding to and saying, this was perfect. You know, I have one client, he's boy, his is 23,000 words, you guys, but people will leave his event, go home and say, I read it on the plane on the way home. Thanks. That was awesome. And he, that's how he funnels people into his mastermind groups and his events as well. But people like short books. And particularly when you're teaching something, yes, you want to give people examples and stories that will motivate and inspire and show how things actually work. But they fluff. They want to get to the point so they can actually implement and apply what you've been teaching them. That's why they bought the book, right? Yeah, they bought the book because they want to know a little bit about the author. You better make it interesting if that's what it's about. But they really bought it because they want what it is that you're teaching them. So they don't want a whole lot of fluff. Great. It's all about the results. If you can give people the results, then you're going to have raving fans. Yep. And these days, you know, I've always been one where my time is my most valuable resource so I don't buy big courses even you know not just books but like video courses if they're like if it gets past like two hours of material I'm like no nope. <laughs> I'll you know I have the money but I don't want to spend the time am I frozen no it was me I'm closing my other things okay. you're good for me right now. <laughs> okay but so that's you know whenever I'm looking at buying a course or buying a book I'm always weighing the two things against each other is the the money investment and the time investment too same with software you know this might be the really sexy software but is it going to take me more than an hour to learn it if so then it better Ooh. the ROI better really be there so same with books and that's and it doesn't have to be like yeah always results with books but because sometimes it is just for entertainment or infotainment you know but make it an easy read but that's a result too with something yeah I want that's to a result too away with something but like, yeah you so i mean if you walked away entertained emotion and experience or i mean yep if you walked away entertained and that was the purpose of the book and what you bought it for then that's great yeah. And I find that you mentioned um, time. A lot of my clients who are doing um, not so many of the how-to books, the straight how-to books, but the ones who are doing personal development and memoirs that have more story element, they're doing audiobooks mm -hmm. because they want to make it easy for people to consume. A lot of people are, are moving to audiobooks right now. Yeah. And I'm not in audio, but I have been actually consuming audiobooks. I don't like podcasts still, but I love audiobooks just because they're well, because they're thought out. It's not just chit chat, you know. <laughs> I like Nicole, it. some podcasts are thought out. <laughs> it's researched. It's you know laid out in a format. It's delivered in a thought out format, you know. So I like audiobooks. If it's read by the author, if it's read by anybody else, I don't. I am really particular, aren't I? <laughs> no, but I agree with you. Although with fiction, I don't mind a great actor with, with a great voice reading if it's fiction, but if it's nonfiction, I want to hear from, like, if it's the story of your life, you need to be reading it yeah. or, you know, something based on your experience. I want to hear you reading it. You yeah. Know? But not everybody's as picky as you are, Nicole. I guess. Like Brene Brown, I love all of her books, but I won't listen to them if she doesn't read them because I want to hear Brene Brown. <laughs> See, and that's, that's so interesting because books are so subjective because Karen, so Karen's on, but Karen and I have a, a big, like, sort of, not debate, but, so Karen loves Brene Brown, too, and mm -hmm. I love her talking and her concepts, but I don't like her books, her books, so, you know, it's all kind of subjective, I'm, is it hurting her that I don't like her books? I think not, uh, <laughs> she's doing just, just fine, so I have, you know, some friends, it's kind of a dividing line, some friends, they either love her books, or they're just not going to read them, it's, it's subjective, but she has her audience, sorry, Karen, I didn't mean to throw that's you okay, and I'm with Nicole, <laughs> though, because the first book I ever listened to by Brene Brown was somebody else reading it, and it was like, I liked the information, but it was really difficult 
to listen to. I did not like the um, the voice actress, whoever that was. And and it, as it turns out, Brene like redid that one so that she was the one reading it. And every other book of hers that I've listened to has been her. And it's so much better because she's like, she's from Texas. She's a storyteller. Like, and to hear her tell it is so much better than... Me all day. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, anyway, I, I digressed a little there. So coming back to ghostwriting. <laughs> <laughs> Writing of all kinds, whatever you yeah. need to know. Ghostwriting, book writing. So why would somebody hire a ghostwriter as opposed to writing the book themselves if they're already like a blogger and, and creating their own material? Honestly, the, the primary reason people hire me as a ghostwriter is time. So if they are incredibly busy, if I look at the people I've ghostwritten books for or co-written, so ghostwritten just means I can't say that I wrote it, it's confidential. Co-written is the exact same job, but I put my uh, name goes on the cover as so-and-so with Candace. Very mm -hmm. simple. But mostly it's time. It's a time factor. Either Well, I'll take that back. It's a division between time and zero interest in writing. So if you're already blogging and doing all that good stuff, you don't have zero interest in writing. You have an interest in writing, right? But a lot of the people that I work with, they're executives or business owners, and they writing is not their thing. They're not, it's not that they're bad at it. They're just not super interested in it. So they'd rather tell their story to me and have me write it. Or they really, truly if they were to prioritize writing a book, they'd have to deprioritize something else and they don't want to. Right. Because that could cost them more money or yep. they could fall behind, stress, all that stuff. So all your system stuff. is actually really cool because you interview people to get the story out of them, right? And then you actually do all the work. <laughs> Yeah, well, they've actually done all the work, right? Because they've already come up with the philosophies and the, the, you know, strategies or whatever it is I'm getting from them. So they've done the really, really hard part. I couldn't come up. I learned so much from every ghostwriting client because they're all super smart about something that I'm not. Mm -hmm. So they've done the hard work on their, on their end. And then we work together to decide what's going in the book, what's not going in the book, how structured, who they're targeting with their book, what that target market really wants from them. What do they want to lead that target market to? We figure all that out together, and then I craft the questions. And then we get on Zoom like this, and I interview and record them, and I write it up. So that part would be hard for them. It's not hard for me. So they've done the part that would be hard for me, which is coming up with ideas about building an empire. That's not my bailiwick, but, but my bailiwick is the writing part. So yeah, the interview process is fun. That's so you do all the strategizing, you like, they just come to you and go, I want to be an expert in this or something, or I am an expert in this. And then you start with the strategizing and come up with a title and okay, here's where we're going to lead people. And then you come up with the questions, you get on Zoom and they just wait for their first edition to look at it and go, yep, nope, change this, change that. And then, well, it's a go. <laughs> well, I mean, a it bit. depends on the person. <laughs> Yeah, but it depends on the person. Like, some people are like, they come to me with a title, like they just have a title and they know that's what they want their book to be. But it is really my job to help them figure out everything in between, right? To get from idea or title all the way to, well, some people I go all the way through publication with because they just want help all the way to the end, like mm -hmm. cover design and interior and all that. But it's really my job to make sure they have a great book. So, yeah, I do have to help them figure out where they're going to lead people, what strategies do they want to include, what part of their story do they want to include, who they want to talk about or not talk about in their book in the case of a memoir or something like that. So, But the interview process is super fun. It's interesting. Some people want the questions ahead of time so they can think about them and really, you know, cogitate over it and know exactly what they want to say. And other people don't want to know anything ahead of time. They just want to show up. Let me ask the question and they can off the cuff tell me what it is. They feel like they in that sort of blind interview style. So I do whatever they want, whichever style they prefer. I, it works for me either way. But um, it's interesting to see the, the differences in personalities and how people want to be interviewed. That's cool. And how did you end up doing this? And how did you come up with your system? Just refinement? Yeah, so <laughs> I ended up doing this because I was married and then not married and I need to make money. And so I was writing fiction at that time and I was writing literary fiction, which was taking a really long uh, time to write. And so it was going to be a long road to making money on that. And 
uh, the guy I was dating at the time, who I can talk about because he's my husband, um, <laughs> he he is now. He's that was cute. <laughs> that was <laughs> years ago. <laughs> so, there he is. So he uh, he met a he had a friend. She was a chef. She wanted to write a cookbook. She asked him to write it, but he knows about as much about food as I do about aeronautical engineering. So he asked me if I wanted to do it. And so I did do it. It was really hard because it was the first book that I, you know, had ghostwritten and I was doing it for a traditional publisher. And so they had their requirements. Uh, the chef had her requirements. Her agent has had his requirements. It was a lot. Mm -hmm. So creating the system happened over time from all the things I did wrong in that first job and kind of the next few few jobs, just trying to make it easier on both the client and myself as time went on. That's cool. Yeah. Well, you guys, the way topic tables work is that you can pop in and ask them some questions too. Let me see. There's a chat box. Let me see if there's anything in there. You can unmute or ask a question via chat if you want to ask anything about writing a book, working with a ghostwriter, co-writing a book with a writer, selling your books. Self-publishing process. Self-publishing process. And you don't have to say it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, a good point about the publishing. And I know Candace and I have talked a little bit about that. But what are your thoughts on like self-publishing versus like attempting to go the route of finding an agent and having somebody else publish it and all of that? So I, I think both can work really well, depending on what your goals are. So most people who are writing a book for business building purposes don't want to wait to go through that whole process mm -hmm. of, you know, finding an agent could take a year. And then the agent has to sell the book. Now, you haven't even written the book yet. You've only written the proposal and maybe one to three chapters and the agent has to sell the book. So that could take a couple of months, three months, four months, five months, six months. Then once it's sold, where does the publisher have room for you on their publishing calendar? Because they've got that planned out years in advance. So if you want to publish traditionally, you may find that it takes you two, three, four years to get your book to market. Some people don't care about that. They just want to write a great book. They want a publisher who can help them more easily get it into bookstores because you can get into bookstores if you self-publish. It's just a different path that takes longer and is more work for the author, right? So some people don't mind that though. They, they will wait and go through the traditional process because that's what's important to them. They want to be in the bookstores. They want to have the cachet of being chosen by a traditional publisher. Nothing wrong with that. Just know that it's probably going to take longer. Self-publishing, you control the timelines, period. But a lot of people think, well, with self-publishing, I'm going to have to do all the marketing. Well, guess what? With traditional publishing, you're going to have to do all the marketing. So, <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're like Stephen King or Brene Brown or somebody who's already got, you know, that the book that the books that the book publisher knows is already going to make the millions, they're going to put money into them. But for most of us who haven't proven ourselves yet to the traditional publisher, they're going to send you on your way with a few brochures that they print it nicely for you and say, "Go market your, you know, marketing is on you no matter what." Yeah, and that's that's the thing. That's the thing I've heard from. Uh, some friends of mine have written some books too and had agents that they were like, why do I even have this, <laughs> this guy? Cause I'm doing everything. I'm not yeah. here like, you know, humping it, doing everything. So agents yeah. will get you the deal and negotiate the deal and they want you to get the best deal you can cause they get their percentage. Mm -hmm. And typically once you get your advance, you're never going to see another dime. So you want to get the biggest advance you can possibly get. The thing is with an advance, you have to earn that back out and you don't see the numbers, the publisher controls the numbers of how you're earning that back out. Most authors never make any more money and the agent sees their job primarily as getting you that deal and getting you the best advance. They are not gonna be out there marketing your book. And that's where we have such an advantage as marketers, you know, as online business owners. We know how to do the list. We know how to be on social media. We know how to be doing this stuff. So if you do get a book, it's just like selling anything else in some ways. I mean, obviously there's other things, getting into libraries and bookstores and things, but the online side of things, it's get on podcasts, get featured in interviews, get you know as much exposure as you can, as if you were selling anything else, a video course or yeah, coaching, yep. <laughs> a retreat. And you know, it's all the same thing. Sometimes you have to yep. get on the phone and Great leverage, all that good stuff. 
And some people never, like I have authors who are very successful who never sell in a bookstore and never have their book in a library. They're still incredibly successful. So mm -hmm. those are just different avenues to sell and they work well for some people and other people don't choose that strategy. Yeah. And that's what, you know, we've talked about this at the Beach House too. And that's what I always tell my coaching clients is, do something remarkably, you know, so if you have a book then, and you want to get exposure to it, pick something and just focus on doing that like better than anybody else does and get everywhere. Yeah. So you know, choose, what are you going to do? Webinars, try to get a webinar a day in front of a different audience. Podcast, get on every single freaking podcast you can get on. Guest blogging, go out and, you know, pick something and freaking yep. do it well. Don't like okay, this week I'm going to podcast and next week I'll, I'll try a webinar because then you can't perfect anything. <laughs> and then you quit. And that's why most quit. authors sell less than 100 copies of their books. Speaking mm -hmm. of podcasts, I had a client, she's so smart, but she, she wrote her book and she was preparing her marketing plan all along. And when her book launched, that same week that it launched, she 30 different podcasts aired interviews with her. 30 different podcasts, you guys. So if you listen to podcasts within that, you know how when you listen to one podcast, you kind of listen to the community of podcasts of those podcasters who know each other and come on each other's shows. If you were listening in that community, you heard her over here and then over here and then over here and then over here. Fantastic for her book sales. She has sold over 50,000 copies of her book at this point. 50,000 copies. Self-published. That's amazing. And I'm sure Not she came at course. it from different angles. If that was me, I would have come at it from different angles for every single interview yes. that people would be listening to multiple times. And yes. again, your story is going to be similar. You can change your story a little bit. Not change your story, but change the way you tell your story or what yeah. you focus on in your story. And then, you know, jump into some other meat. She did. She did. Yeah. She's a smart cookie. And she sold the books to prove it. So. That's awesome. Yeah, she too was offered a um, traditional book deal. She took it from HarperCollins she, because she wanted to be in bookstores. She wanted to be in Barnes & Noble. That was her dream. She's a big old book nerd like me. And she was in, she did a Barnes & Noble tour and it was great. And then they had given her a three book deal. And then she asked to get out of the deal because she said, I make more money when I self-publish. So I'd rather self-publish. Thank you very much. So a deal. But she, you know, it was kind of more of a, 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 a prideful dream for her then it was a big money maker for her. So she went back to self-publishing because it was just more lucrative. Very cool. So who else wants to ask Candace a question while we have a minute left? <laughs> I got a quick one, I think, unless I'm interrupting somebody else. We're not at all. <laughs> Go girl. Um, so yeah, I agree with Candace a hundred percent that like everybody should have a book <laughs> um, and self-publishing does seem to be the way that would like fit a lot of people who would, be like a part of this call and stuff but like self-publishing doesn't mean like I got to do every single I mean you talk about the ghostwriting but I think people get intimidated also by like how am I going to format this thing and get it printed and so like you could hire out like any step along the oh, way right? sure. I mean like what do you tell people because it's like some people are intimidated by the writing but then just all the moving parts like yeah. how do you even navigate that stuff and like what do you tell people when they're intimidated by that, that kind of thing. Like, okay, I have a so, great idea, but. So my thing is the most important money you're ever going to spend and other people will totally disagree with me is on your editor. Um, pay mm -hmm. for good editing, even if you're a great writer, because you can't see your own stuff. You know what I mean? And you don't have to, ne it doesn't have to necessarily have to be super expensive. There are different places where you can find less expensive editing, but it's so worth it. But in terms of the design and layout, you can, if you feel technically gifted enough, I am not. Um, use templates for cover design. Uh, one of my favorite places is thebookdesigner.com. It's Joel Friedlander, and he has interior book design templates that if you feel like you're tech savvy enough, with mo which most people in this community probably are, frankly, because you guys are way ahead of me on the online stuff, mm -hmm. but you can just drop in your content if you have a simple design into his templates, and it does both the ebook and the print book format for you. He also sells, sells book so those are super low cost. If you just want to farm out the whole service to someone, you can get that done for between $1,200 and $2,000, cover design, interior design, ebook design. So if you budget for that, you can do that. But if, if you don't want to do that and you feel like, look, I know how to use a computer, I can do this, get the templates and use the templates. The one 
Um, big red flag that I always want to tell people about when using a publishing services company, though, is if you're paying them a fee up front, they should not be making money off your book on the back end. Because what I see is some publishing services company that charge companies that charge you $2,000, they create your cover, they create your design, they do all this great work. But then every time you sell your book, they take another two or three dollars off your profit. Mm -hmm. And you have to sell through them. You should not be required to sell through the publishing services company. You should be able to take those files and upload them anywhere you want. Those are your files. You own them. You should be able to take them anywhere you want and upload and print them. Um, and of course, you pay for printing services, but that's that's totally different than paying a royalty to, to a company that you've already paid for services. Huge red flag. I'm not saying it's unethical. I'm just saying I don't like it. Wow. See my soapbox, Karen? That's a great point. I, I wouldn't have thought that. And it's like, yeah, why are they getting a royalty on my content? You know, they, some, they, they, some they, companies do. Yeah. And, and I just think it's, a, I don't think it's appropriate. And I don't think it's fair to the author. Yeah. So red flag. Okay, we have time for one more question. Anyone else have something they want to ask our awesome Candace? Going? going all right so candace where can people learn more about you candace l davis.com candace with an ice not an ace because i'm cold like that <laughs> <laughs> this will be at beach condo in february in the sloth condo in the, in the sloth, sloth condo, condo. <laughs> yes we have to come up with like a, a call for our condo like <laughs> what's the sloth this? call i'm gonna have to google that now <laughs> I'm so excited for Beach Condo. I loved, of course, I love Beach Camp because I get to see so many people every year and every year they're new people, but then the same people and I love seeing everybody. And then I went to Beach House this year and that was amazing. That was just like totally transformative. So I'm excited for Beach Condo next. I'm excited to see you. Are you coming back to Beach Camp? Oh, girl. Yes. Good. Of course. Karen. 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 <laughs> Come on, girl. I don't share a room, but I will share with Karen. Sure. <laughs> I'm so honored. I'm working on it. October's a, a little crazy with some weddings and stuff like that we're going to, but uh, I'm working on it to have it, well, have it penciled in. Camp is in May. May. Oh, you're I'm thinking of the wrong thing. EP. I'm thinking EMP. Yeah, yeah. We're, oh, we're okay. talking Daytona Beach. Yeah, where are you yeah. way ahead of me. <laughs> you got to plan for these things, girl. I know. She's you right. Have, you have babysitting to arrange. I know. And dog sitting, <laughs> cat sitting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how I ended up with a fish, but somehow I have a fish, <laughs> fish sitting. <laughs> like, like, really? Really? <laughs> I don't have enough stuff to take care of? Oh, wow. <laughs> how did this fish get in here? Whoever's responsible oh. for this fish needs to step up. <laughs> you know, that can be easily taken care of, Nicole. I'm just saying. <laughs> I know. All I have to do is stop feeding it, but I can't. Oh, <laughs> Because I can't starve a creature, but well, you could set it free though. <laughs> <laughs> Swim in my little toilet, fish. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly and Nicole. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. I had to zip not saying goodbye. No but. worries. All right, you guys. Thank you so much for being on the call, and I look forward to seeing you on our next one next month. Thanks, everyone. Thank yeah. you. Bye.